Good morning and welcome you all to the virtual Social Market Foundation this morning. Um, very grateful to you all for coming. Um, uh, hopefully you're um, aware of what you're here to, you know, to participate in and, and listen to. If you've um, arrived here by, by, by accident, and do, do hang around and learn, and learn things about, uh, uh, about youth policy anyway. But um, uh, anyway, hopefully you, so you, you, you're here because you, you, you intended to click that link that brought you here. Um, uh, actually, I'm James Kirkup. I'm the director of the Social Market Foundation. Um, in a minute, uh, you'll be very pleased to know I will stop talking and uh, hand over to uh, the first of our illustrious speakers, uh, Deborah Rawls. Um, uh, we'll then go through uh, well, short-ish opening contributions from our panelists. Um, uh, I think we go for you, 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 Deborah. Uh, then, um, yeah. and so we, 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 we just did this a second, a second ago offline. Off, off I've managed to confuse myself again. We're going we're gonna to go from De De Deborah, uh, Deborah, Dan, Joe, Andrew. Um, uh, and then we will, we will then come to questions. Um, when we come to questions, if you'd like it to be, um, yeah, if you'd like to, we will put you on, we will put you on camera or, or on audio anyway. So if you, um, but there's lots of different ways to ask a question. You can you raise the electronic hand on uh, on Zoom. I'm sure you're all familiar with that by now for a year of doing this. Or you can type you can type in the chat panel or uh, in the Q and A box. I will do my best to uh, keep an eye on all three of those, and then uh, I will direct my colleagues who are invisibly waiting in the wings to. Put you on audio uh, on camera if you like and you can put your questions directly to the panel if i get a bit confused by the different uh bells and whistles and things appearing on my screen do forgive me i might it's because i'm relative to everybody almost everybody participates in this event i'm very old and so this is all um you know this is all a bit beyond me um i certainly feel old this morning anyway um uh i think that's about all from oh into you know, me, me for housekeeping um we're actually just to Bear in mind when you are asking that question, we keep the video of this event uh, online. Um, and so it will be featured on the SMF website for all time. So just remember you're, you're not just speaking to the uh, 50 something you know, and rising people who are in the audience at the moment. You, there's, there's a follow up audience um, that generally runs into several hundred. We tend to find with these events um, afterwards. Um, uh, before I hand over to um, uh, to, to Deborah Rawls to kick us off, uh, I should say yeah, 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 thank you to, to explain. This event is um, part of uh, the SMF's partnership with our friends at Policy at Manchester. Uh, Policy at Manchester is the uh, the policy engagement wing of the University of Manchester, which works to bring the uh, the expertise, the learning, the knowledge of uh, academics like Deborah um, and. Uh, and many others to the the world of Westminster and Whitehall, where under ordinary circumstances the SMF is physically located, and at the moment is uh, is figuratively located. So um, that's what we're here to do. The SMF uh, being, hopefully, you know, a uh, cross-party think tank and also a registered charity. Our charitable objective is to educate the public in the social and political science, or so the sorry, in the economic and political sciences. Uh, so we, we we like to think of our work with our academic partners like policy at Manchester as being very close to the core of what we're here to do. Um, anyway, that that is um, I've now managed to use up uh, nearly six of our sixty minutes um, for this meeting. So I've, that's my that's my ten percent. I should um, uh, I'm definitely going to stop talking now um, uh, and hand over to Deborah Rawls, who's going to give you a quick overview of her research on this question of how to engage. Uh, I'm actually do it, Deborah. I'm, there's no point to there's, there's no point in me trying to summarise your work. You can do it, Deborah. Tell us tell us all about all about your all, all about your work. I'm, I'm going to be I'm going to mute myself and cough a lot. Now. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, James. Um, hello, everybody. It's great to be here um, and. Uh, Lovely to be presenting with two uh, two leading young people, Joe and Dan, and obviously Andrew as well. But it's great to have two young people on the panel today um, when we are discussing children, young people, and engaging um, them in post-COVID policymaking. So, just briefly, I'm uh, an academic at the University of Manchester. I'm a research fellow in Manchester Institute of Education. 
at the university and my research looks at how we can try to redefine our approaches to education policy and practice um, for more inclusive um, places and economies and of course that automatically um, includes how we um, engage children and young people in policy making and decision making in the places where they live. So just a little bit of context, I'm sure you all are very much aware that children and young people are among the worst affected by the socioeconomic impacts of COVID-19. And, you know, previously, prior to the uh, pandemic, children and people were already disproportionately affected by austerity policies and are likely to be hit hardest by the global recession caused by the pandemic. And, you know, we've, we've all seen that during the pandemic, um, there's been quite a lot of frustration from um, many children and young people over the lack of any real opportunity for them to engage in meaningful discussion over social and political issues that affect them, their families and the communities. And, and this has resulted in, you know, feelings of marginalisation and um, being neglected by policymakers. And this has all been heightened during the pandemic. Um, but, but I think that the pandemic has also shown us as adults, as professionals, as policymakers, how much we have to learn from children and young people. We've seen during the pandemic, more than ever, I think, that children and young people are interested in engaging in politics. They are interested in engaging in democratic processes and social justice. They're key change makers. I mean, we've got two of them here today. We've key change makers, activists and campaigners. Um, and this has really been brought to the fore, particularly um, with children and young people leading um, campaigns around climate change and Black Lives Matters. So I think we're uh, at a real pivotal point here. You know, the economic and social recovery from COVID-19 gives an opportunity for real positive change. And there's a need for our national and local governments to do things differently, to become more responsive to the interests of the young, to consult and engage them in collaborative discussion, debate and decision making. That's the key thing, collaborative and ongoing discussion, debate and decision making about the key issues that are affecting them their families and their communities. And this is about more than having a voice, more than having a say. This should be an ongoing collaboration. So how do we do that? Well, I think there's a need, as I said at the start, for us to redefine the way we look at education. I don't mean neglect what happens in school. I don't mean neglect um, the importance of examination results and employment outcomes. But we need to look beyond those individual examination results and employment outcomes. If we want to have inclusive places and inclusive economies, education needs to look different. What would the education of a place, for example, of Manchester look like if we were to have children, young people actively engaged in, in policy making, decision making in the place where they live? So, as I said, we need to move beyond the individual uh, academic achievement and develop education policy that has at its heart a systematic approach to build stronger, more democratic learning and decision making relationships with children and young people. And education has a key role to play in building the skills, knowledge and the relationships. And I know the two young people we have here today, Dan and Joe, are all about building those relationships. But education has a vital role in building those skills, knowledge and relationships that enable children and young people not only to have the right to be heard, but to be respected and to be taken seriously by those in power, to be young decision makers. So education needs to connect children and young people to the information that they need and the people they need to know in order to participate in informed democratic decision making in the place where they live. So how do we do that? Well, if we think about a place, one way to do this would be to redevelop education and have a curriculum of a place where we had learning labs, learning labs situated out in communities. And the aim of these learning labs would be to develop collaborative learning networks among diverse groups of children in different neighbourhoods and between children, neighbourhood decision makers and policy makers. They're sites of possibility for collaborative learning. Every child would know that she or he would have the opportunity to go to a learning lab two or three times a year and engage with policymakers and other young people to develop shared ideas for an inclusive place. And children and young people could also learn there about the political agenda and decision-making processes in the place where they live. 
And alongside that, the curriculum would be form a, a type of apprenticeship, the right to the place, where the aim would be to give children and young people the right to the place in its entirety. Education policy should be about more than learning opportunities that are situated in the museum or art gallery, but should be about developing learning opportunities that explore diverse areas of the place beyond those traditional sites of education and that enable children and people to contribute to improving policies for the benefit of all citizens. Our children and young people should be viewed as experts and educators. They should be able to teach others about the area where they live, its possibilities and its challenges. And the key thing at the heart of all this is that children and young people must be given the opportunity to act as citizens now. They are not future citizens, they are citizens. Citizenship does not start at 18. It is children and young people's fundamental right to participate in matters that affect them. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Deborah. Um, now we'll, we'll in a second. I'll hand, I'll hand over to uh, to Dan Dan Laws from Youth Politics UK. But I just to, to I guess uh, um, warn Deborah and pretty pretty Deborah Andrew and everyone in the panel actually was one of the themes I'm I'm going to be keen to come back to and get to questions is I think your your almost your first framing idea there, Deborah, which is around the pandemic and trying I'm just I'm very interested in this sense the extent to which I mean bluntly the, the pandemic response has involved you know, us collectively asking young people to make sacrifices for you know, to preserve the health of people who are older. Um, and I wonder whether or not that's something that's been fully uh, reflected yet in political conversation. I don't know, we, we, we have a lot of good rich detail, detail conversation to have around your points there and very interested in, in learning labs and, uh, and, and so on. But, I, but that's the sort of uh, the, 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 the big picture idea I'm, I'm, I'll be keen to ask everybody about later on so you can start uh, start anticip anticipating good, good good answers to that question later on. But, um, Dan, Dan Laws of Youth Politics UK, what do you make of all this? Amazing. Good morning. Uh, can you hear me okay? Can you all? We Fantastic. Can. Very well, good. Very good. Here. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you to Social Market Foundation and the policy engagement team uh, in my home city of Manchester uh, for organising the event and catalyzing such a, an important discussion. Um, delighted to have discussed this research with Dr. Rawls before. And she's right. I think the first step is having young people here as part of the conversation. So thank you to uh, the SMF and University of Manchester for doing so. A bit of background into my work. Uh, I'm the founder and chairman of the non-profit youth-led national organisation uh, Youth Politics UK, which works to empower young people through democratic engagement by providing free training in the likes of debating, public speaking, but also provide a space of facilitation with policymakers and young people. Um, aside from that, I'm also a young advisor to the Bank of England, uh, an I Will ambassador, and a youth inclusion champion for the UK mission to the UN, which is a fancy way of saying I'm helping to uh, expand their networks to reach out to young people. So as you can see, sort of young people and policy making uh, is something that uh, I live and breathe. And uh, so I'm delighted to be here today. Um, but as someone who sort of does live and breathe policy making, I want to start off by analysing the current state of play. Um, and I, I would like to reiterate uh, Dr. Rose's argument here that the current state of play for young people and policy making is bleak, unfortunately. Um, young people are neglected from key areas of the uh, political and policy making process on matters which do significantly affect them. Um, for many of us working in the area, we did know this already, um, but the COVID-19 crisis really has brought it into a new light, not only bringing into question fair representation in policy making, but also key questions about youth citizenship. Um, and I think the first notice for, for the likes of myself working in this sector um, was the questions regarding press conferences, right? When the Prime Minister came out, uh, to give press conferences under 18s weren't allowed to submit questions and I thought that as a generation uh, under 18s have these concerns why can they not put them to the Prime Minister that was one first key indication that something wasn't right but we saw it throughout the crisis whether that's questions regarding education with the A-level uh, debacle there um, you know I'd, I'd question um, uh, you know the higher education task force for example how many students like myself are actually on that task force talking about the issues that face us. Um, I know the answer to that. I 
uh, we've put in freedom of information uh, requests. And unfortunately, the answer is not one which we'd want to see. So again, that's a reflection of young people being neglected from the process on policy matters that really do affect them. Um, and again, questions regarding jobs um, and youth unemployment. So I'm working with the Bank of England on, on monetary policy um, and advising them on, on youth affairs. But, you know, we need active voices uh, in the likes of the Treasury, talking to them about the impact face to face that, that young people are having, but also recommending uh, policy solutions to resolve them. I'll talk a little bit like that uh, about that in, in a bit. You know, the key the key point here is that we did offer, you know, young people are ready to step up myself and young leaders from across the country with with huge networks at our disposal. You know, youth politics has networks of thousands upon thousands of young people, particularly here in the north. Um, we were ready to talk to to policymakers and we wrote an open letter to number 10 saying, uh, you know, please use us, please use our networks. And we didn't hear back. Um, so that's a, a key point to raise. Now, I think it's just important just to know, you know, why is youth inclusion and policymaking important? Well, first of all, it's a matter of principle. I think we can all agree that a demographic who's affected by certain policy measures should have significant input uh, in, in the process behind that and have a voice throughout shaping it. But number two, it, it, it makes for better policy. You know, if you could have asked any young person, you know, put to them what the the supposed solutions to, to the A-level crisis uh, last year were, we would have flagged instantly what the consequences would have been. Um, we would have told you that young people would have been unhappy with it and the backlash from it. Um, so we can often foresee, and you know, we, whenever I advise on policy matters, um, we often get the feedback that, that policy is made better as a result of youth inclusion. So let's not see it as something which we have to bring them in, see it as a beneficial aspect that can really benefit society as a whole. But third of all, citizenship engagement, which is something which I work strongly on. Let's, I think it's a fantastic opportunity to bring young people into the political discourse and also make them better citizens uh, for which society as a whole will benefit. Um, no, I know I don't have too much time, so I'll quickly go on sort of next steps there. Um, so look, this is a hopeful discussion. We are hopefully bouncing back uh, from COVID. And whilst we do so, I think I, I reiterate Dr. Rules's argument here that it provides an amazing opportunity for us to engage with young people, to affect, to, to find solutions uh, to issues which, let's be honest, are going to affect young people more than anyone. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I'm delighted that Andrew is here as well. So, you know, young people are resilient and we are very much keen to engage in policy making process. What we need now is the likes of Andrew and uh, I was talking even to, to Baroness D'Souza last week, who's got a new ignited passion for, for youth inclusion, which I love to see. Um, we need these figures to step up as well, because we we are here, we are ready, we have our networks that we are ready to utilise. We need policymakers in Westminster to listen. Um, but, you know, if looking at practical steps and how to achieve that, I would say, look, we have huge networks across the country. There are youth organisations who have outreaches of, of hundreds of thousands of young people. Please do use us. We have expertise in, in facilitation. We have expertise in linking up young people and policymakers and doing finding solutions that, that benefit all. Um, so please do get in touch and please please do use us. I absolutely love Dr. Rose's uh, 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 solutions surrounding uh, uh, learning labs. I've, I've told her how much uh, I really appreciate her contribution to the field, and I really hope that that can take the discussion further. I'll just leave on the note that you know many of the issues that we are going to face as a society post COVID um, are not just going to affect young people the most, but they really are going to require young people to be part of the solution in order to solve them. Um, but I'll leave it there for now. Uh, and uh, you, can I say, yeah, I'll be okay. another, another forewarning of the uh, great questions I, I, I'll raise later on. Um, I'm really amazed so far. Well, uh, there's something with a two speakers down there. Nobody's mentioned something I was expecting you to talk about. But I'm, in fact, I'm not going to see what it is. I'm going to see if Joe. I'm going to see if Joe mentions it. And see if Andrew mentions it. But uh, we'll come back to that. There is a there. There is an issue which I'm, I'm amazed has not yet come up. But it will. Anyway, I'm going to hand over next to uh, to Joe Seddon of uh, yeah, who has two two hats on here. Joe is both uh, CEO of Zero Gravity and also I think trustee of the British Youth Council. Um, so um, I don't know, I don't know which 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 of those capacities you're here in today, Joe. But um, both either uh, both either. No, up, to, up to you do you and uh, uh, do you have tell, tell us about that and what you what you make of all this sure thanks for the introduction james i think it's worth before i go into my comments actually just considering why should we care what young people like what are the normative reasons for actually listening to young people i think deborah articulated 
really nicely at the at the start of the discussion that there's clear social good in giving young people a voice if we live in a representative democracy we can't just assume that people's parents are repositories and conduits of of young people's thinking so giving young people a, a voice is clearly good for strengthening representative democracy but one of the things i want to stress is actually there's another really good reason for giving young people a voice and that's actually about competitive advantage not just social good institutions and governments who give young people a voice are going to be more dynamic and innovative than those that do not clearly for the reason that when young people are at the table you've got a greater amount of cognitive diversity and you're getting real insights on the ground from real people allowing your organization to, to stay alert to what's going on in the world already in the private sector big organizations especially in the direct consumer space are doing lots of work with young people they bring them into insight labs putting them at the, the forefront of their marketing and social media efforts. They're not doing that because it's just a good thing to do. They're doing that because they see it as the future of their, their business. So I think people in the, in the policy space, in the charity space can learn from that as well. It's about competitive advantage, not just social good. And I think there's a couple of reasons why young people in particular can deliver organizations competitive advantage. I think the first is about culture. I mean, nowadays, so much of culture is actually created by young people. You just have to look at what's happened in the pandemic. There's so many, so many of those cultural memes that have arisen during the pandemic have emanated from social media like TikTok, which young people are at the forefront of, of driving. Now, young people have grown up with social media through their mobile phones and have become incredibly attuned to it. Young people are naturally sort of media producers as well as consumers and and that's and that's um that's interesting because it means that actually a lot of the media which is produced nowadays is being produced by young people so if you don't have um if you don't have insight into how that's being made and 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 um and distributed you're going to miss out on a whole load of of culture but the second reason is as well is that because young people have grown up with social media and they're producing so much of it they're, they're almost hardwired and have an intuitive sense of engagement loops and virality. And that's so important for any organization because a lot of growth nowadays comes through those engagement loops. Now, just look at some of the organizations which have become famous during the, the pandemic. A lot of them have grown through viral spread rather than traditional means, whether it's um, you no know, TikTok or a food sharing app like Olio or those no, sea shanty memes. The viral loops are, are the main ways of distribution nowadays, and young people have these hardwired into their psyche, so they're best place to help organisations deliver them. But I, I do want to end on one warning, though, and I, and, and this comes from me and with both my hats on as a as a CEO of a social mobility organisation and also a trustee of the of the British Youth Council, which represents young people across all four corners of the UK. And, and that's that we should be careful before homogenizing young people. I, I think recently there's been some really good discussion in the areas of race around homogenization. There's some interesting articles over the past couple of days about the BAME label and how that may homogenize the, 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 the thoughts of groups with very different ideas about community and belonging and, and their own identity. I think we should be careful with young people as well before ascribing to them uniform opinions about social issues. Now, one of the things I really noticed as a, as a young person myself, and I, I originally come from Morley in, in West Yorkshire, is just how much variation there is amongst the thinking of young people. Sometimes we are stereotyped as um, you know, very socially liberal, um, and, and having certain views about certain issues, sometimes denigrated as, as snowflakes. A actually, there's a huge diversity of opinion. Actually, one of the main things I noticed when I made that socially mobile journey from coming from Morley in West Yorkshire to going to Oxford University is just how different opinions about social issues were amongst young people in my hometown to university. Now, when I got to Oxford University, the way people thought about issues like national identity, belonging, and community was incredibly different from young people who grew up in the area where I'm from. So one warning note would be that we need to listen to young people all over the country and particularly in suburbia. Now, I'm, I'm all in favor of using urban hubs as a, as a, great, a great focus point for, for attracting young people, but we can't let students and young people living in the suburbs go ignored as well. And how do you reach those people? And, and for me, digital technology in particular 
is the most scalable way of getting the thoughts and opinions of, of people in the suburbs. So I, I think I'd be really interested to hear Deborah's opinion on how we get a, a nice balance between having these urban learning labs, but also make sure those in the suburbs can connect in as well. Um, thank you very much, Joe. And you, you, you very nicely anticipated um, another theme I wanted to get some thoughts on later on, which is that point about social media and the the voice it gives people and therefore the, the cultural shift that's taking place, um, yeah, which is, I, I will come back to that, but before I hand over to Andrew Perry, you, you've also given me a very nice way of introducing Andrew, um, who was nodding enthusiastically when you mentioned the sea shanty, and I, I, I should have told Andrew that as a, since he's an Abaddonian, um, we, we were actually going to ask him to give us his, yeah, he gave us his his favourite sea shanty just uh, just before he starts his remarks, so um, just for a couple, a, couple of, a couple of minutes of playing song would be great, Andrew, before you start talking, but... Um, <laughs> Um, I'm afraid. I'm afraid, James. I, I think for everybody's uh, 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 he, eardrums, I, I, I won't be uh, uh, take, uh, partaking in your offer of, of demonstrating my inability to sing. Next, in next time. Next time. Join the enjoy the today, but next time, absolutely next time, I'll, I'll, I'll regale you with my favourite sea shanty. Hello, uh, James. Everybody, thank you so much for asking me uh, to come along today. It's uh, Genuine pleasure to, to, to be here and to, to hear from such interested speakers on an issue which is incredibly important and more important today than it, than it probably ever has been. And I suppose I should probably begin uh, with an apology to, to Dan and and, uh, and all the, the young people watching this and around the country. I mean, something really struck me that Dan said he had contacted the government to, to offer through his the organisation that he's a part of to help develop policy. Uh, through the pandemic and as we emerged from it and he hadn't heard anything back and I, I don't think that's good enough um, we have to engage uh, with young people we have to recognize that the, the the pandemic and subsequent necessary lockdown that we imposed on the country has uh, impacted uh, on the lives of young people in this country more than any other generation yes of course uh, the, the virus itself was uh, much more dangerous to uh, the elderly and the vulnerable but in terms of the life chances uh, of young people, uh, this lockdown has affected them more than, than anybody else. Uh, you only have to look at, at how university education is being curtailed, further education, the jobs market has practically uh, ceased to function, uh, people trying to get on the housing ladder with a deposit, uh, an average deposit being up about 25%, looking just completely out of reach to your average young person in the country today. We must do so much more, we have to do so much more to engage uh, with young people. One of the, 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 the highlights of my time in Parliament was back in 2018 when I was Parliamentary Private Secretary to the Department for Culture, uh, Media and Sport uh, under Matt Hancock, then, who was the Secretary of State. And I was uh, asked to address uh, the Youth Parliament. It was the one and probably only time that I'll get to address the House of Commons from the dispatch box. But it was, uh, it was a fascinating uh, session, uh, really engaging. And the variety of topics from uh, knife crime to youth engagement in politics to you name it, they talked about it, was, 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 was inspiring actually to hear the passion with which young people actually spoke in the chamber. It was probably one of the most passionate and well-informed debates I've been a part of uh, in the chamber of the House of Commons in the four years that I've uh, been in the place. And I think that that's the sort of thing we need to see a lot more of. And there's no excuse for, for politicians and policymakers not to engage more. Uh, with young people uh, today. Throughout the pandemic, one of the things I've been doing as Vice Chairman uh, with Responsibility for Youth in the Conservative Party is actually on a near weekly basis engaging with uh, younger members of the party uh, through Zoom forums and introducing them to uh, members of the cabinet or ministers with responsibility uh, for areas that, that they might be interested in. We've had a more engagement with more young people across the country through the pandemic than we have ever had at any point probably in the history of the Conservative Party, because we haven't been London-centric and, and needed to bring people, uh, uh, ask people to travel miles from their homes. They could join us and engage in debates and policy discussions uh, through, the, through the miracle uh, of Zoom, uh, which of course does have its downsides, but is a, a genuine, I think, a benefit to doing, doing things like this. So that's really good. I was also struck with something Joe said at the end there about the the... The, the, the lazy uh, trend of people to uh, describe young people as one homogenous group and to ascribe uh, particular views to the 18 to 25 year olds. Look, there is just as much diversity of opinion in the 18 to 25 year old 
age group as there is in any other generation in the United Kingdom or around the world today, um, sometimes perhaps more so. Um, yes, of course, that generation is, is different from generations that have come before. They're more connected with the world than ever before. I think my generation, I left school in 2005, was the last to go through uh, education uh, without, the, the, without social media. Uh, or YouTube or anything like that. But, uh, and so that has made a huge difference. But uh, other than that, they are just as diverse in their opinions with just as many original ideas uh, and exciting ideas to feed into the policy framework as any other generation that's come before us. So we need to get away from this sort of lazy stereotyping of young people. Look, it's an, as I said, it's an absolute privilege to be here today. We need to do a lot more to engage uh, with young people. I'd love to see more formal mechanisms between the youth parliament and the, and the, and, and, and the House of Commons as it stands right now, probably starting at local council levels, because some of the, 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 the biggest decisions that affect people in this country, they're actually taken at a local authority or a devolved authority level. So I'd love to see uh, connections grow between schools and local authorities, local authorities and youth parliament, youth parliament and the House of Commons. And I'd like to see us engaging in that. I'd love to see the government reaching out to young people to actually hear their ideas a lot more in a formal and constructed uh, basis. I'm really looking forward to being involved in the Y7 summit that's going to be coming up in a couple of months ahead of the G7, because we are focusing on domestic policy, but goodness me, some of the biggest issues of our time are very much international issues, and young people around the world have a lot to say on that as well. So I really am welcoming the fact that the G7 are reaching out to the younger generation as well and engaging them in, in, in an incredibly important process. But I'm going to stop talking there. As a, as a member of parliament, I'm sure you can all uh, expect and understand that I would speak uh, forever if I had the opportunity, so I better wrap up and uh, better get to questions. But as I said, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, following three very inspiring speakers, not least uh, Dan and Joe, who are coming at this from, from a lived experience of being a young person in 2021 and living through what we've lived through uh, over the past year. So James, thank you very much, Timothy. Thank you, thank you very much. And now I, I will, I've got a couple of questions I want to, I'd like to get your all of your thoughts on before we you know, come on to some questions from our audience who are, um, I said, just to repeat to members of the audience, I know some of you are already, but you, there's, a, there's the Q&A panel, the chat panel, and also just, or if you'd like, just, just raise, a, you know, raise a hand on the, uh, raise your electronic hand, we'll, we'll come to you. But um, I, the first question I, I um, you know, want to ask for thoughts on was something that, um, uh, that Joe really raised there. I said that that point about social media and the voice that it gives uh, members of the current generation of young people. Because as I say, in a way, I feel a little bit old and jaded because I'm 45 and I'm one of the sad creatures who spent my entire life. You know, literally, I did my first job at at Westminster when I was 18. I'm that I'm that pathetic. This is all I've ever done, and so I feel like I've been hearing this conversation about how politics and policy can engage young people uh, better um, for a very long time. And what I'm interested in is whether or not this conversation is now different. Whether or not, you know, bluntly, you know, the generation of I mean, Dan and Joe and Paul, I, you know, Andrew, you're probably I think you're, you're probably an elder member of the generation, but you still can't. Um, yeah, you know, whether or not there are, you, you collectively have a different idea of uh, the voice you have and how that voice should be heard, because now that everybody has the ability at the click of a button on a screen to uh, you know, to express a view and to engage with uh, others at a distance, whether or not it's organisations, government, politicians, companies. Um, whether or not, you know, what, if there if that is a unique challenge posed by this generation's, you know, Cultural, you know, cultural expectations, um, and if so, what you know, what particular uh, changes are unique to this generation you know, that, that, that should be made? I, I don't know if um, Deborah, is, could could I maybe start with you on that point of how where where that sort of that sense of well, if just the practical use of social media and technology, where that comes in your in your work, but also more on the sort of the, the broader sort of cultural you know, cultural expectations that it, uh, it maybe encourages. Yeah, I mean, I think I think in terms of the the way young people use social media, I'll leave Dan and Joe as the young people on the panel to uh, to to talk about that because they're far more expert in that than than, than myself. I mean, I, I think with with my work, it, it's obviously social media is very important in um, enabling um, young people to to raise and discuss issues online and to um, campaign for things that they're, they're passionate about. But I think with my, my research, I'm looking at um, bringing people together. I mean, obviously there'd be a social media element to it, but bringing people together in, in, 
in real life, if you like. And, and one of the things that both Dan and Joe raised is really important about the ideas that I'm suggesting in that, you know, th th this is a, about a curriculum of a place. And Andrew referred to this as well in terms of devolution. You know, when we're thinking about the type of place whether it's Morley, whether it's Leeds, whether it's Manchester, um, that we, we want to have. And I know Leeds has um, an inclusive growth strategy, as does Manchester. Leeds um, uses the social progress index as well as GDP for measuring um, how society is doing in Leeds. You know, we need to think about how are our children learning? So yes, social media will be important for bringing children together, but this is about, opportunities for children and young people to come together with decision makers and make decisions about the places where they live, all children and young people in all their diversity. And, and also to meet with, you know, what Joe raised was very important. Um, the, the, the idea of the learning labs doesn't ignore suburbia. It's about bringing people together from children, and young people together from different areas of the place. So that if you're a child or young person, who, I mean, and this isn't just related to um, socioeconomic disadvantage. If you're a child or young person from one area of a, of, a, of a place, from Morley, for example, you perhaps have never been to the other side of the city. You know, you might have gone into the city centre. And that applies to the most privileged children, the most economically privileged children, as well as the most disadvantaged. So my, the work that I'm suggesting is very much about thinking about how we change education to bring different groups of children together on a regular basis with policymakers, with practitioners, with organisations like Dan's and Joe's, um, so that all children not just feel they have a say, they do have a say and they are decision makers in the place where they live. So social media will be important in building that and enabling those conversations to continue outside the learning labs. But as I said, Dan and Joe are far more expert than me in talking about the actual but, impact. On I, how I guess the, the, the thing to say, take away from your point is that actually there is still a real value in getting people physically in a room that you know, while for all the, 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 the influence of voice you get from those online channels, you know, getting people to turn up and be in a place together still has a, has, has great value. Definitely, yeah. Um, yeah well, Dan and Joe, well, Joe, I think you've, you've I mean, obviously you've, you've inspired the question, I suppose, so I, mean, I, might, I might skip you if that's all right, unless you have strong feelings on it, but yeah, go, go to, um, to, you, to Dan. I mean, what are you, I mean, what are your thoughts on, um, I mean, that point about, you know, the, the differences between, you know, get, yeah, getting people to engage digitally and actually getting them to show up i mean there's a, there's a great phrase in politics you know the people you know decisions are made by the people who by the people who turn up um uh and how you know setting up and running your you're running your organization how you know how easy is it to actually get people to you know, to make a physical commitment to be present for something obviously difficult at the moment versus clicking a button and engaging that way awesome cheers james it's a, it's a fantastic question um look I'm, i'll tell you a, a a wee story from from youth politics experience you know we had this concern right up in manchester that young people wouldn't show up for an in-person in-person event and on a budget of nothing on a saturday morning it was actually snowing um we held a conference and 500 young people from across the region showed up to discuss to debate and to engage with politics from across the region from different socioeconomic backgrounds um, to engage face to face with the likes of Andy Burnham, uh, Alistair Campbell was there, Channel 4 News showed, Michael Crick was there. It was a it was a fantastic sort of celebration. Andrew, we invited the Conservative Party, so uh, I, I'll just just throw that one out there. I was um, just going to say that was a very one sided panel, but that, <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's a fantastic on, opportunity. Why. We did <laughs> we invited we invited pretty much everyone we knew uh, yeah. from from across the UK, uh, including those of party leaders. Um, so I think that's a great example of the idea that young people are willing to to step up and uh, and talk in person now. So there are great benefits to that, but there is something crucial here, which is we have to go where young people are as well, right? We have to meet them where they are. And it's undeniable that young people are on social media and are online. Um, 
And I think it, it bemuses me that the government haven't, I think it would be funds very, very well spent uh, in, a, in a mass digital consultation facilitation, uh, whether it's an app, whether it's a website uh, to engage with young people. Now we have attempted to do that. I know the British Youth Council have tried to do it with DCMS, uh, a platform called Involved on, on Instagram. Now I think, you know, a, a lot of us, I think would agree that there are, there's a lot of work to be done on that front, but I think that's at least a, a signal that an acknowledgement that that is where young people are but one one thing that i think i would i would note here and it's it's i think it's a really important point is social media hasn't just given a platform for young people it's given a, a platform for the whole of whole society anyone can jump on twitter and shout angrily and i think one of the actual things we've got to acknowledge is that social media has actually been a deterrent for a lot of young people um going on and voicing their opinion you know i only joined twitter a few years ago it can be a very we all know a hostile place um, and we've got to show to young people that that's not the discourse we want and actually create spaces in which they can use it. So I think that that's just a, a point to note there at the end as well. Um, thank you very, very much, Dan. And actually, you, you've nicely te te teed, up, um, you know, teed up Andrew's opportunity to come, to come into this. And I'm particularly interested. Andrew, is a, I mean, you, you're both a practicing politician and a, you know, um, probably just about as you, you can as a digital native, I suppose. Um, do you think the, the, the politics, political policy and, and policy making processes, you know, do you still tend to favour people who turn up in the room over, you know, over online engagement? Is that is that a fair sort of a fair vast generalisation about the way the way politics and policy works? I think it is fair, actually, James, to, to characterise uh, policy making as being more skewed towards people who are in the room than just social media engagement. I think I think on social media. Dan just touched on it in the end there. You know, you've got good and bad, right? The, the good thing about social media is that politicians and policymakers have never been more accessible to uh, people than they are they are today. I mean, when I was uh, growing up and, and remember when you were growing up in Deborah, you know, the idea of just reaching out uh, to a politician on a whim and asking them a question, you know, that it, it was just impossible to comprehend. You would have to write a letter or go to their office or, you know, you know possibly... And slightly later on, I send an email, but the idea that you could just send a one-line message on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and expect that MP or that politician or policymaker to reply uh, was just simply fanciful. It just wouldn't have crossed, crossed your mind. So that is a really good thing. So people have more direct access to their representatives than ever before. The bad side of social media, as Dan said, has been that there is a lot of abuse uh, let, let's just not let's not beat be around the bush uh, on social media, and it can be a very divisive uh, place to actually engage in political uh, debate, and that can be very off-putting uh, to some people who have genuine ideas and want to get into the policy-making space, but are put off by the vitriol and the anger that they face from some people uh, on social media. So I think. With that in mind, that might be why we need to try and find a way through a sort of a middle ground, a third way, if we're uh, talking about Alistair Campbell as we were a second ago, uh, of, uh, uh, of utilising the best of uh, social media, and the best of the online sphere, as well as uh, still keeping that really important aspect of being in the room. Because, you know, uh, the, 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 the way that you can bounce off people and, and, and Juice ideas and, and the sheer organic nature of, this, of, 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 of thinking and thought processes that develop good policy, you know, often come from people being in the same room as each other. But that shouldn't exclude people that aren't able to make it to the room or can't get to that room at a certain time on a certain day. So I think what we are learning, and, and goodness me, it's been sort of uh, uh, hardwired into us over the past year, is that. You know, we can utilize platforms like this, platforms like, like Zoom to have a conversation. I'm sitting in Aberdeen, you know, Deborah's sitting in Manchester, James, presumably you're sitting in London. We're all coming together to have a really interesting debate, but that shouldn't be at the expense of the, the thing in the room. So we can utilize the best of both worlds to actually uh, take things forward. And I think that's how we, that's how we, we have to do it. Thank you very much. Um, and for, Joe, forgive me for, for missing out on that, but I feel like that was your 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 topic in a way. So we, 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 we we're gonna, I'm going to go on to um, first question from one of our audience. Our audience, um, we've got Andy Mycock, uh, Dr. Andy Mycock. Uh, hopefully, uh, Andy, if you're happy to put your question directly to the panel in a second, one of my colleagues will be un, unmuting you and possibly making you visible. I don't know if that's. I'm not sure if am I unmuted now. You are unmuted. We can hear you, Andy. So, and, and Andy, what's your what's your question or thought for our thought for our panelists? Certainly. Um, 
I was just wondering, one of the issues about um, youth voice is, is, is electoral voting rights. And across the United Kingdom at the moment, depending on where you live, depends on the electoral voting rights you have. In Scotland and Wales, young people can vote in local and sub-state national elections, uh, but not in UK-wide referenda or elections. Uh, young people in England and Northern Ireland uh, cannot vote until they're 18. And that would suggest that uh, UK citizenship in terms of political rights is, is fracturing. Um, as present, um, the UK government has not devolved electoral franchise rights to august bodies such as Manchester City Council or the Greater Manchester Combined Authority in the same way as they have done to the Welsh Synod or uh, the Scottish Parliament. I'm just wondering whether the, um, the panel has any views on the issue of equalising voting rights across the United Kingdom so that all young people have the same voting rights and it's not a postcode lottery. Yeah, um, or yeah, Andy, I should say, there are Andy, Andy, I think is from, Andy helped set up the Greater Manchester Youth Combined Authority, um, I, I think. Is that right, Andy? That's right, yeah, I was on the uh, Youth Com Citizen Commission, uh, which was set up under the uh, Labour government uh, in 2008, which last looked at the voting age question at the UK level and also looked at issues around citizenship education and uh, particularly the access of young people to decision makers across the UK. Thank you. Thanks for that, Andy. And I should say that this was, this was the issue that, I, that I, I, when I mentioned earlier on, I was surprised none of you mentioned it, this was the issue I thought someone would, 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 would raise. So um, that, you know, that was it. Um, now, I just want, you know, can I come to Deborah on this first? And particularly, I guess, um, obviously there's the broad question about where you what the voting age should be and the sort of disparities, you know, the differentials we're trying to see across the UK. But you know, I'm just curious to know whether or not, you know, from a sort of place-based approach, um, whether or not you, you think that this is the sort of decision that should be, you know, dare I say, it should be made at a, uh, you know, at a local level. I think, you know, you know, Andy sort of suggested that a postcode lottery approach would be a bad thing. Wouldn't a, wouldn't a sort of properly devolutionary approach be uh, one that put the decision about how to engage young people in uh, in the electoral process you know, be, a, be, a, be one that actually whether that, that decision was made at, you know, at the local city level, the authority level. Um, any, any thoughts on that, Deborah? Yeah, well, first of all, um, thanks, Andy, for that question. And I, I, I would be all in favour for bringing um, England and Northern Ireland in, in line with uh, Scotland and Wales in terms of young people's voting rights. Um, I'm a little bit, um, I would like to see, I think, the, 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 it done on a national level rather than, um, as James was suggesting, for example, Greater Manchester being able to decide that they wanted young people in Greater Manchester to vote at, at say, 16, because I think then you've got you have got an issue of further divisions in outlying areas. So if you're not if you're not in an area that 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 uh, that has a devolved mayor, for example, then it could mean that young people in those areas are are excluded and they they have to wait until eighteen to vote. And that raises the issue that Joe was talking about before as well. I think if you know if you're in the suburbs or if you're in a more rural area area, then you'd be disadvantaged. So for me, it has to be um, uh, adopted at uh, nationally. And I think we should be in line with Scotland and Wales. Right, thank you. I'm going to uh, go to um, uh, Joe and then Dan, and then uh, come back to Andrew on that. If that's okay, Joe. What do you um, uh, vote? You vote, voting age, Joe. What you, what 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 should be, and how how important is this in you know, is you know, is the voting age question to you know question of engagement? I think the fundamental question here is, is one of incentives and, and the voting age is, is part of that. I think that the reason why the voting age is important is if you give young people the right to punish politicians at the ballot box who do not represent their opinions, it, it's a massive incentive to actually engaging with, with young people. But I think we have to be realistic as, as well about the current situation. Like, is it likely that we're going to see the voting age across the rest of the UK drop to the age of 16 within the next three to four years. I, I think that's pretty pretty unlikely given the, the, the focus of current policy debate and also um, the uh, the interests of the um, of, of the, the current party in, in, in government. Um, so I, I think I think we should be focusing on, on alternative ways we can incentivize politicians, policymakers to engage with young people. No, voting is, is one way of of doing that as well, but but part of it, as, as Deborah referenced earlier as well, is, is about measures. 
Um, no, do organizations and institutions have measures and KPIs which are about actually you know, the views of young people and making sure young people are included in the in the debate? Like that's one way to to incentivize. Another way is actually just to um, just just to give policymakers more face time with, with young people. No, it's a uh, it's, it's an interesting incentive. If you, if you put someone in front of a group of people that don't quite want to uh, meet, that can be quite an awkward experience so making sure that you know, politicians leaders of charities leaders of organizations spend time with young people i, I think is another really good way of, of, of sort of strengthening the mental resolve to um to go out and do things but but I, I i do think that's a really key part of the debate because one of the things that has really frustrated me about the, the youth sector and, and the youth debate is sometimes it can feel incredibly idealistic and and one of the things that i think you know campaigners like like dan are so incredible at is actually focusing on issues where they can actively go out and and make change and have an influence so i actually think so sort of thinking about this in a way of okay what are the things that we can realistically change how can we change incentive structures to really have a nice ripple effect is, is the way to look at this this issue um rather than envisaging some kind of uh, youth-led utopia where all young people automatically have their uh thoughts uh transmuted into the heads of, of politicians and policymakers. thank you um dan do you um uh do you have any, any, any thoughts on that question I mean, if, you, if you can get you know dare I say, if you can get 500 people to turn up on a, on a snowy snowy morning in uh, in manchester for a meeting um you know can't you get them all to vote <laughs> that is a fantastic point it's something which i've been racking my brains about for the past past four years um Look, I think the, the, the key question here is, is, is why is this discussion occurring? And I think for me, and, and I'll give you, give you an example in a bit, the 16, the, the, the idea of lowering the, the voting age to 16, I think is, is, is extremely important because what it indicates is that young people, current policy measures are not affecting uh, the issues that young people care about enough. And so we're trying to find solutions to, to ensure that young people can, like Joe say, hold politicians accountable. Because at the minute, the current system isn't working. You know, one of the main reasons I set up youth politics was I was, I thought it was a complete, one of, one of the, the worst uh, disgraces to democracy that 16 and 17 year olds could not vote in the EU referendum. I thought that that was genuinely horrific a state of our democratic and I, you can tell how angry i got about it because it was going to affect our generation more than any other um generation um so i think the, the discussion there to have is whether or not policy is 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 accurately reflecting young people's interests and, and the current state of play is that it's not and what are the solutions we can have to do it now i'm always in favor of lowering the voting age to 16 i think all the arguments against doing so are completely flawed when you actually go and talk to 16 and 17 year olds are they mature enough yes they are come to one of our events and find out do they know enough about the political process some say then they're, they're not but i would argue you know yes they are but also you know i think that their current state of engagement is actually more than other demographics across the country who do have the right to vote um so i'm i'm all in favor of that and i think i agree with dr rules there about about ensuring that that's a national national level because we don't want to risk that those divisions i know i know andy well and he's done some incredible work in this in this area up here in in the local local region but i think you know let's finish on sort of the point there that, that joe's mentioned over the next three years i think my focus as a, as a campaigner in this area is definitely at looking at I will always be fighting for, for votes of 16. So I think it's, I don't think it's a matter of if now, I think it's a matter of when. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the time in which that occurs. Um, but I think at the minute, you know, my, my attention is definitely at creating these spaces for young people to engage. And that's why I'm really grateful to Dr. Rules' work. And yeah, I hope that's where the momentum really is over the next next few years. Thank you. And I, I, Andrew, Andrew's in danger of getting the last word in this event, because we're, we're wrapping up shortly. But I mean, Andrew, you, you know, I, I, I won't make this a sort of simple question of, you know, why why isn't your party doing the thing that you know that, that joe and dan have just asked for i'm, I'm, I'm curious we know, we know that you your position on this i'm curious to know what uh you know, what you think the answer is to you know the, the ways to meet the demand that you just heard expressed for yeah. uh, a voice in in process in, in your voice yeah. in politics but politics and policy from people in that 16 to 18 bracket how can you do that without uh without extending the franchise yeah, so it's a really interesting question, uh, James. I'm sure we could talk for much more than the five minutes that we've got uh, on it. Interestingly, of course, I'm speaking to you from Scotland. We're in the middle of an election campaign right now. Where are the franchises uh, from the age of 16? I think we need a debate more about the age. I'm, I'm not averse to 16-year-olds uh, having the vote. I'm, I, I, I don't I at all subscribe to the idea that 16-year-olds are not 
uh, able to comprehend big political issues or able to engage with the political process. I think some of the toughest sessions I've ever had as a politician has been engaging with schools and, and it makes uh, questions that look like a walk in the park when you're in front of a, uh, a class of 16 or 17 year olds asking you questions on everything under the sun. I think we need a, a, a wider debate about what age you actually reach a majority in this, in this country. I mean, that, it, it's all over the place as far as I'm concerned. I mean, you, you can drive at 17, you can drink at 18, uh, you can vote at 18, you can get married at 16, join the army at 16. I mean, I think we need to actually come to, come to an agreement on what age you become an adult in this country. And at that stage, you should be able to pay tax, get married, join the army and vote. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm open to, uh, to, to any ideas about what age uh, that might be. I, I, I do contest slightly Dan's uh, point about, you know, being, he was very frustrated not being able to take part in the EU referendum uh, because uh, the franchise wasn't open to 16, 17 year olds. Look, I get that. But then the guy who's, or the girl who's 15 years, 364 days old, will be the one that's most frustrated about not getting to take part in the process. There is a cutoff at some stage. I was three weeks young to vote in the 2005 election and I was uh, pretty angry and upset about that. Uh, that was quite a long uh, time ago now but uh, look I think yeah we need to as I said in the beginning we need to come up with some formal uh, process engaging young people in the political and policy making process. I'd like to see uh, uh, firmer links between the youth parliament and uh, the, 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 the House of Commons that stands right now. I'd like to see more formal links between schools, local authorities and, and youth parliament. I'd like to see young people feeding in their ideas through that process because I agree with you. I don't think that uh, the government's about to change its position on on the, the age that, that the people are allowed to vote in this country anytime soon. So until we do get to a stage where we are having that debate, let's actually figure out a way around that. And I'm open to any and all uh, suggestions as to how uh, we can take that those ideas forward uh, within government. It's something that we have to do. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. I, I think you've um, successfully um, positioned yourself in, in, in this meeting as uh, the recipient of a lot of emails following up on uh, um, uh, following up on on this session. Um, so we will we we were we were, we were already going to send you down, yeah, send you down Dan's Dan's memo and uh, and a copy of uh, a blog that uh, that Deborah's written about her work. Um, they may, they, I think there'll be there'll be other stuff coming your way as well, which you can feed because I think we we, I, we haven't we didn't mention mention this. Obviously, you have a um, as well as representing your constituency as well as your position in the um, uh, in the Conservative Party hierarchy. I think you have a you have another role working for you. You're, you're doing, doing some sort of prime minister for the prime minister. As well. Well, don't you? Uh, well, no, I was PPS yes, to, the, sorry. To, the, to the former prime minister. Yes, sorry, uh, former, uh, a, for, a former, a former, a former PPS, 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 the number ten. So, yeah. um, anyway, you, you have you have the right phone numbers, anyway. Um, so, um, but yes, yeah. Whether they pick up is another matter, Jim. No, indeed. Um, but memos will be coming your way, Andrew. We're very grateful to you for for coming along and engaging today. Um, uh, we've got sixty seconds left um, uh, for this conversation. So all, all I'm going to do is actually I, I'm going to wrap up and I say thank you all very much for uh, coming uh, uh, to this event. Uh, thank you to the panel, Deborah, Dan, Joe, Andrew. Um, thank you especially to the U Policy at Manchester, the uh, who, uh, as I said, the policy engagement wing of Manchester University who make these events possible. Um, we will, I think, um, afterwards be, um, all, all of you by signing up to this event, you've uh, given us our, you're given us your email address and we will be emailing you all um, a copy of a blog that Deborah has written on the Policy Manchester website, setting out more detail of her work on learning labs and uh, the rest of that work and how to uh, engage young people in local place-based uh, policy making, so more, more detail there. Um, uh, and please do follow up with with Deborah and Policy at Manchester. Um, and obviously, I'm sure you you know, I I can get I know from looking at the people who are intend, attended this event. Sorry for a couple of you who didn't get your questions in. Um, I suspect they will be emailing us to ask us to pass on our pass on their documents and thoughts to you know to to various members of the panel. So I think we'll be will we'll be delighted to do that. Um, so. With that, I'm going to croak my way to a conclusion, having um, just about made, um, made it to, to the end of the hour without uh, without my voice giving away. Um, but I will just say thank you all very much. Um, have a nice rest of the day and a happy Easter when it comes. Thank you all.